All right, so we're now being recorded. Boker Tov, Bruchim Abayim. Welcome, everybody. Great to be back here on Zoom and studying weekly the Parsha with you and uh, hopefully going a little bit beyond the literal meaning of the text and trying to find something that's of contemporary value and significance and relevance. So when I was reading over the Parsha the last few days, you, you know, usually I find some things that are a little bit different than I've considered in the past, but when I read this Parsha, a whole bunch of stuff came to me. So I, I'm probably going to throw a lot of different things at you today, and we're not going to get a chance to discuss a lot of them in, in great detail, but I, I'm going to leave you with hopefully a lot of questions and things to, uh, to think about as we reflect a little bit on this week's Parsha and some of the things that uh, I've chosen to highlight. So the first thing I would do is... Start at the, if we, do you, by the way, do you have a, a chumash with you? Does anyone have a chumash with them, whether the Eitzchayim or anything else? Okay, so I'll read the relevant passages, and perhaps in the future I'll have a link that you can refer to uh, so you can follow along. By the way, anytime you want to follow or get text from the Tanakh or any Jewish sources, there's a fantastic site called sefaria.org, S-E-F-A-R-I-A. -E -A -A. It's got everything. Everything, Talmud, Tanakh, uh, Midrashim, modern commentary, etc. It's, it's a fantastic site. So anytime you want to access uh, Jewish sources, Jewish texts, go to sefaria.org, and you can either view it in English or Hebrew or the two of them at the same time. So it's a fantastic resource. Um, I'll put it up here so you know where to look even while we're speaking. Where do I find it? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yes. I've got. So just go oh. up on the, go to the website. And uh, I've, I've put the website up there, W, you know, of course, uh, okay. WW or whatever, sephria.org. So see if you can find the text even while we're speaking. All right. Michael, I, I have a Tanakh, but I didn't look to see what Parsha. Uh, so what Parsha Vayishlach. So tell us. Parsha Vayishlach. Okay, did you hear that, Anna? Parsha Vayishlach. Put it on the chat because you're breaking up. I don't hear it. Oh, here. Vayishlach. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, and, and then what uh, number? Vayishlach. So it's, if you want the chapters, chapter 32, interesting, begins at verse 4, not at the first verse. 4 and 30, 4 and chapter 32? Chapter 32, chapter 32, verse 4. So I want to start with something that actually I, I read by, as I often look to the JTS website, because often in their weekly drasha, dvar Torah, uh, there's almost always something there that's, that's wonderfully creative and, and new. And Rabbi Matthew Berkowitz, who is actually the director of Israel programs at the at JTS, uh, he offered some interesting insight into one element of the encounter between Esav and Jacob, and we'll, we'll get back to some other elements in the Parsha, but this is just something I want to focus on for a moment. So if we look to when they actually meet after all the preparation, and as I say, I'll come back to the preparation in a moment, uh, it's in chapter 33, and the verse I want to look at initially is verse 9, and I'll, I'll read that in a moment for those of you who don't have a Tanakh. But as you recall, there's this great trepidation and anxiety that Jacob feels before this encounter with his brother, whom he hasn't seen in 20 years. He hasn't got a clue what his brother thinks of him 20 years later, how he'll respond upon seeing him after being cheated out of the birthright, if he still holds a grudge. We don't know this, and Jacob doesn't either. Uh, so there's this great fear, and he goes through all sorts of means of dividing up his camp, and eventually when he goes to meet them, he separates his wives and concubines and children into prioritized guards. So he, the ones he cares for the most, and it's quite clear that that's the case, Rachel and Joseph. He keeps as close to him as possible, and the others he sends out in front. So if, you know, if it takes a while to assuage uh, Esau's anger, let him take it out on those that are a little less dear to Jacob than his beloved Rachel and son Joseph. Uh, and that's not much of a paraphrase. That is 
pretty clearly the way Jacob feels about that. But we'll come back to that in a moment. The, the point I want to reflect on for uh, right now is when they come across each other. So they hug, they kiss, and they cry. And then Jacob, of course, uh, after Asaph asks, who are all these people? What's, what's going on here? So Jacob says, I want to offer you a gift. And then Esav interestingly responds, Esav, yesh li rav achi, shalach. So Esav says, I have enough, my brother. Let what you have remain yours. So he says, I have enough. It's, it's, it's actually a, not an accurate translation because Esav says, yesh li rav, I have much. I have quite a bit. It doesn't say enough. Enough is a, a very... Uh, subjective evaluation of what one has. Because when you say I have enough, it means I'm satisfied with what I have. When I say I have a lot, I'm not saying I'm satisfied. I, it's saying I know I have a lot, but does it mean I want more? So there's a fascinating question what Asav is saying. It says, I have a lot, and so you keep what's yours. Now, let me ask you this. Why do you think Asav might be somewhat reticent about accepting the gift from Jacob. Any ideas? Why, why would he not accept it? Why say, oh, brother, that's lovely. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that gift. That, that's, that's a beautiful gesture on your part after not seeing you for 20 years. Why does it, why would a sub respond? I have lots and I'm just, I'm just translating. I have much, you keep what's yours. That, that's all cool. Anna, go ahead. Is it not because in that, that, uh, culture you don't say yes thank you and take it you say oh no 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 thank you i have you know i, I have enough and then the other person says no no please take it you say well no thank you no and then you, you go back and forth and then finally you take it beautiful beautiful and we have and we have another one second Bela, and we have another example of that not too long ago we recall the uh, negotiation between avraham and afron hachiti over the grave uh, the, uh, the burial plot that Avram wants to purchase for his uh, uh, deceased wife, Sarah. So what goes, Abraham says, I want to buy it from you. And Ephron says, no, 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 you, you take it. Let me give it to you as a gift. He says, no, 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 I insist on paying. No, 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 all right. And then he says, well, you know, hey, what's 400 shekels between friends? Happy to take your money in the end. But, but you're right. There is this gesture of um, a polite protocol about accepting gifts and offering gifts, and perhaps that's what Asab is following here. Bela, you have another perspective. Uh, I would think maybe there might be a reverse to that in the sense that Jacob had already taken away from him his birthright. And so there was this element of, uh, I'm not so sure that this guy is who he, he purports to be. You know, I have enough. Thank you very much. You've already taken from me. So to me, that would be the divide or some kind of a division that he would create so that he wouldn't have to either be disappointed or in fact that they it wouldn't come down to that. So I think this was a reserve and this was a, a position that he took that would be to pr be protective as opposed to being, you know, I, I think gracious, yes, but I think protective more. Okay, I, I, oh, sorry, Barbara, you go ahead first. I was wondering if uh, Isaf didn't want to feel beholden to Jacob. I, so I, th I think both of you uh, are touching on something that's that's important here. Uh, while I feel that there is this cultural element that Anna referred to, that's part of this this dialogue, I think it goes beyond that. I, I think there might be a, a sense here. You know what? I've got enough. I've 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 got I've got lots, and I'm not sure. This is what he's saying under his breath. I'm not sure. You know, you want to offer me a gift? You think that's going to make up for what you did to me 20 years ago? I'm not sure. I don't, I don't want to close the account with you so quickly. I, I, you know, I don't want to let you off the hook like that. By, by, by giving me this wonderful gift, you think I'm going to forget about what you did to me, cheating me out of the birthright, the blessing from my father? Hold it right there. That's, you know, I, I, I don't need that. So there may be an element of that. We, we don't know. Uh, but despite their perhaps questionable, uncertain uh, embrace and kiss, and if you if you look at the text, I don't know if it shows it in whatever chumash you're looking at, but over the word vayisha kehu, there are all these diamonds, all these dots in the Torah, in the Torah. It's not accents; it's these special markings that are placed on a number of words in the Tanakh to indicate that there's something unusual about it. So why would they put it? And one over every single letter of vayisha kehu. Uh, 
in terms of, and, and he kissed him. Why would they do that? Well, maybe that maybe that kiss isn't so genuine, isn't so sincere mm -hmm. as we might like to believe. And it shows that despite this willingness on the part of both brothers to meet and, and, and to explore, uh, there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty. It's not all of a sudden, oh, I haven't seen my brother in 20 years. I'm looking forward to reconciling with him. This is wonderful. Let me kiss him wholeheartedly and embrace him. And let's be buddy buddies from now on. Probably not. That's probably not the case. And so it's no coincidence that over the word vayishakehu, you have these strange dots appearing that appear in other words and often to give us some kind of message uh, about that word or about the true nature of that event that's taking place. So let's skip for a moment uh, a couple of verses down. So how does Jacob respond? No, no, he wants to, he wants to, he wants him to accept the gift. And it says in verse 11, Kachna et birchati asher huvatlach, ki chanani Elohim vechiesh li chol vayivtsar bo vayikach. No, 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 I pray to you, if you would do this favor, accept for me this gift, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God, and you have received me favorably. I'll come back to that in a second. Please accept my presence, which has been brought to you, for God has favored me, and I have, and again, I like the translation here. It says, I have plenty. That's really what Esau is saying, because in the Hebrew, it says, yesh li chol. Chol is everything. Jacob is saying, no, you, you have plenty. That's the word they should have used for Esau. I have everything. I've got everything I need. So, Whatever I give to you, it's because I already have everything. There's, I, I, it's, it's not, nothing off my back in a sense. I'm not sacrificing anything. Um, and I started with this because Rabbi Matthew Berkowitz brings in a couple of Mifarshim, Sfat Emet being one of them, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Leib Alter, who talks about why is there this difference in terminology? Why does Esav say Rav, plenty, and Jacob say Chol, everything? Uh, so let me just read this something to you that uh, the Sfat Emet reads. The meaning of all seems to indicate more than a sav meant when he previously said, said, I have much. But how can any person say all? Surely there were some things that he didn't have, Jacob. But for one who is attached to the divine, whatever he has is all. For everything contains a point of divine life. In that point, all is included. Thus, the Midrash says, all are considered blind with regard to Hagar who found the well. This means that all is really found everywhere because everything contains that godly life. That is why God is called Shalem, because every point of divine energy contains all. So the last point's a little bit uh, confusing, but I think what they're saying is because of Jacob has admitted and expressed his connection with the divine in a number of instances, uh, stopping every so often on his journey to Esav and stopping on the way back at places, building an altar, sacrificing to God, promising earlier to God that God will be his God if he returns safely, conditionally, of course. But the sense that because I have a connection with God, I've got everything. I'm connected with everything because God is everything. God is connected with everything. And so that enables me to feel that I have access to all. Even if I don't have everything, I have access. I have potential to reach everything because I'm connected with the divine. It's, it's a, a fascinating thought. Um, I think it's a wonderful idea. But when you say that Jacob has all, it means, it would seem to mean that he's come to some point in his life with maturity, with acknowledgement, with realization of satisfaction, of, of contentment. But if we look at the continuing story, that's not the case at all. Jacob still has uh, a lot of issues to deal with, and that's what I want to turn to now for, for a few minutes as well. So I think if we go to the incident where Jacob struggles with the stranger. This is the night before he meets his brother. We're going to go back several hours before he actually meets Esav. Um, he insists on receiving a blessing before releasing him. If you recall, they're struggling, they're holding. Jacob holds him until dawn. The angel strikes him in the thigh. Uh, and that's why we don't eat the Gid Hanasheh, the thigh muscle, etc. You know, what, what a fascinating uh, rationalization for that not being kosher. But anyway, the fact is that Jacob 
holds on to the angel or man, whatever it is, and there he's described in different ways, and says, I'll only let you go if you bless me. Now, we might say that Jacob has reached some kind of level of maturity, at least we'd like to believe, perhaps by this uh, incident with uh, the rav and the coal and thinking that he has everything. Um, and why does he need that blessing? Because perhaps he realizes the blessing that he got 20 years ago at the expense of his brother and in deceit of his father, Isaac, because he couldn't say see that it wasn't him, although there's good reason to believe that Isaac really knew who it was, but simply wanted to give the blessing to Jacob. Um, he says, you know what, that blessing wasn't sufficiently genuine. So now I, I, I need to make up for that. I need to receive a genuine blessing. So I want you to bless me before I meet my brother. So I feel that I have a legitimate blessing as opposed to what I deceived my father into giving me and manipulated my brother into offering me 20 years ago. However, if you think of that, how is Jacob receiving the blessing? Is he having a mutual dialogue with this man, with his angel? No. He's doing it again from a, from a point of strength of manipulation. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you give me that blessing. That doesn't sound genuine. That's, that's, it's just a different expression of deceit and manipulation and taking advantage of a situation in order to get what you want. It seems that Jacob has not changed all that much, even through his encounters with God, the promises he, make, he makes. He doesn't seem to appear to realize that you have to deal with people in a different way, whether they're angels, whether it's the divine, it doesn't make a difference. And the fact that he's only willing to let this person go this being go, if he gives him the blessing, indicates that Jacob still has a long way to go before he, re he reaches the point where he realizes that deceit and manipulation are not effective and sustainable methods of developing dialogue and relationship with others. And that brings me to my next point. Jacob's hope, as we'd like to think, is to some, come to some kind of reconciliation with his brother. That's, that's the goal. And if we follow what happens during the encounter between Jacob and Esau, let's try to examine how that reconciliation works. So I gave you an indication at the beginning, it's somewhat uncertain. The first gesture of hugging and kissing is somewhat questionable as to its sincerity, but at least it's its initial step. It's uh, that an engaging embrace to try to test each other out what's going to happen, how they really feel. Because often you can feel, and you think about your personal experience, when you hug someone, you can tell if that hug is genuine or not. You can feel if somebody's reserved when they're hugging you, if they're doing it out of formality, of, out of necessity, out of politeness, out of cultural uh, uh, requirements. You can tell if, it's an, if a hug is of that nature or if it's a genuine hug. And so perhaps that's a great first step to see for the two of them, not just for Jacob, for Asaph as well, if in fact they can come to some kind of reconciliation. But what happens as they go on? How, how, do, how does the meeting go? So Asaph initially is hesitant about receiving the gift. Jacob has separated his camps into different portions based on his priorities and his love for the various wives, concubines, and children. <laughs> and when they separate, what happens? Esau says, okay, this has been wonderful. Let's meet. You know, I'm, I'm going to get going. I'm going to meet. And Jacob says, well, no, I can't really go there because uh, I got young kids. The, uh, the, the, the flocks I have are kind of uh, fragile. And if I, if I move them too quickly and this and that, that's, that's in danger. So, you know, let, let, let's, it was nice meeting you. Let's just call it at that. So what kind of reconciliation have they come to? And I asked that, and, and maybe in a more general sense, and perhaps you might want to take a stab at that. What does reconciliation demand in order to be effective and sustainable? And I'll suggest that you look at it and the context of, and I purposely emphasize this word, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in our efforts to deal with the relationships between Canada and Indigenous peoples. What needs to occur or what has needed to occur, what has gone on leading up to during the course of 
and following the release of that truth and reconciliation report. In order for that process to be effective, what has needed to be done, what needs to be done. And regardless of your familiarity with what's gone on with the truth and reconciliation process, what do you think needs to happen for reconciliation to be effective and sustainable? Anyone want to take a stab at that? <laughs> Bela, go ahead. I think the first word, the truth, that I think that that's the, the big thing. Jacob does not admit to any of his behavior. He doesn't acknowledge that he, in fact, is the one, you know, I'm going to use the word perpetrator, but that that's, you know, it's, he's actually the assailant. He's the one who actually committed the, the deceit. He was deceitful. He actually created the whole situation. Yes, Asaph, I'm sure, was contributory in, in the sense that whatever their relationship was all about, but it, it was important that Jacob had to look inside and see what kind of a person he was. I think that's the flaw. I think that, you know, we've talked often about the flaws of the patriarchs. And, and in fact, Jacob was just such a, he did the same thing. He accepted what Lavan did to him, you know, in terms of, of the, the brides and all of that. He just, there, he was weak. He was a weak character who needed to, in my view, um, needed to make sure that his own needs were met prior to and in terms of reconciliation, you can't do anything unless you acknowledge who you are and what I have done. Okay, great. Anybody else? Barb, go ahead. I think there has to be an acknowledgement on both sides that there's a genuine concern to get this done. Yeah, and, and, and you, don't, you don't see that. And, and in terms of the truth, they don't share, despite the cultural politeness uh, one might expect under these conditions, there's no attempt to explore the past, to discuss the past, to acknowledge the past, to what exactly went on, as you suggested, Bela. They don't deal with it. They're there for some, for whatever reason, uh, to try to come to perhaps some, at least some kind of understanding that they're not gonna kill one another but they don't deal with the issue. And you might say, well, Michael, that's, that's anachronistic. You know, you're talking about uh, social psychological methods that are used and developed over the last hundred years of how to have genuine dialogue, how to develop and maintain and sustain relationships. That, that science didn't exist at the time. Of course, the science in those words didn't exist, but people knew how to get along at some point. Sure, people warred and, and fought and all, over all sorts of issues that perhaps today seem to us uh, uh, unnecessary and uh, passe, but they're not so passe. A lot of that stuff goes on today. And you might say we have better tools and understanding of how to deal with it, but people survived back then. They knew at some point uh, inherently, uh, intuitively, how to deal and maintain some kind of relationship. There's no effort here on the part of either to explore what happened and to move past it uh, and to accept it and to acknowledge it. Uh, and so I think that that's a major flaw in this encounter. And perhaps this encounter is here to show us that despite some goodwill on the part of both, how much we don't know, uh, it's not a successful encounter. Yeah, they don't... <laughs> Let me say that with some reservation. It's not as successful an encounter as it might have been, but there is some success. They don't kill one another. They yeah. accept the fact that each has his own existence. Perhaps the fact that each has his own family now is something that uh, mitigates the anger and desire to seek vengeance on the part of either. Um, we know that how important family is in biblical times. And so perhaps if Jacob were on his own, had nothing, Asaph might have been more inclined to take out uh, some kind of uh, vengeful action against Jacob. But when he sees a family and the continuity perhaps of their father, maybe, and again, this is, uh, I'm just surmising, maybe that kind of softens Asaph's potential response. And so when I said before, and. Uh, and reserved my, my comment about it not being an effective encounter. It is an effective encounter. As I said, they don't kill each other. And when you look what happens later on, 
fascinating, the same term used in a, a generation earlier. It says that Esav decided because he had so much, so many flocks and such wealth, there was not enough room for him in Canaan to live in the same place as his brother. And therefore he moves across the, the valley, the Rift Valley, and establishes himself in Har Seir, Mount Seir, which is Mount Edom today in the south part of Jordan. Uh, that sounds very familiar because if you recall, <clears throat> same thing happened between Lot and Abraham. Uh, Abraham said their, their uh, shepherds were fighting over the land where their flocks could graze. And Abraham said, you know what? There's not enough room for the two of us here. You choose whatever land you want. And of course, we know that Lot moves down to Sodom, which was a fertile valley at the time. And we know what happens eventually. But this idea of family not being able to live together in the same place for various reasons and therefore needing to separate and move elsewhere. So we saw that with Abraham and Lot. We see this again with Esav and Jacob as well. And yet, near the end of the Parsha, not right at the end, what happens? Isaac, the person together with his wife, Rivka, who perhaps brought this whole conflict into play 20 years before Isaac dies, who buries Isaac? Anyone know? Who buries Isaac in Maratamach Pela, that place that Abraham had bought for his wife, Sarah, uh, and where Abraham himself was buried, of course, upon his passing? Both Asa. the brothers. Asa. Asa. And Jacob. Come together, bury their father, just as Ishmael and Yitzchak came together yeah. to bury Abraham. Fascinating. Despite the conflict, the anger, uh, the antagonism that brothers feel for one another, and there's plenty of evidence of that uh, instigated by parents, or on their own, they come together to bury their parents. Fascinating. That, that element of family and last respect paid to a parent forces them to overcome whatever fear or anxiety or hatred they may have towards a sibling and pay their parents that last respect. Also fascinating that nowhere is it mentioned that Rivka passes away and dies and is buried. We, we, there's no indication whatsoever in the, in the Torah that that happens. There's a hint of it when it talks about the fact that Dvorah, her wet nurse, dies. And there's, there's a, a Midrash that says this is an indication that Rivka had died as well. And somebody went to bury her. We don't know whether it was Isaac, whether it was uh, Jacob and Esau. Interesting that that is kind of left out of the whole thing. Um, so there's this lack of reconciliation. And if we look a little bit further to, to explore what's happening with Jacob, it says that after this whole thing takes place, uh, Jacob, in verse 18 of chapter 33, says, And I mentioned before in that commentary by the Sfat Emet, Rabbi Yudha Leib Alter, that talks about God being called Shalem because of the wholeness, the completeness of God. It says Jacob arrived Shalem, <laughs> translated as safe, in the city of Shechem. That's a fascinating connection, uh, juxtaposition of terms, because as we know, what shortly is going to happen in Shechem, the last thing Jacob is going to feel is safe because of what his sons do. And as a matter of fact, he later says in uh, critical comments about what his sons have done, what have you done to my name here? A small group living among these people, and you've damaged that. They're, you know, our, we're, we're in danger now. The last thing we're going to feel is safe because of what you've done to the people of Shechem uh, in response to what they did to your sister, uh, Dina. Uh, and so it's fascinating that it uses a term that's often described uh, with God, shalem, whole, complete. They translate it as safe here. Uh, and perhaps it's saying that in connection with the fact that with all his anxiety about his safety and well-being in leading up to the encounter with Esav, despite all that, he now, he now feels safe after having dealt with his brother in whatever way to whatever measure of effectiveness he has, he feels safe coming to Shrem. It's kind of like a foreshadowing of what's going to happen. He walks into Shrem feeling safe. Uh, it's, it's like telling us if we were reading a book or watching a movie, well, we know that that's not going to last for long. Obviously, they're trying to hint at something. So perhaps it's a little bit of foreshadowing what's going to happen. And without going into the story of Dina, because I know we've, you know we've explored that in the past, uh, 
this idea that Jacob has matured and come to a point where he's able to confront his challenges and his struggles, as many commentators say at the beginning of the Parsha, how do we know that Jacob has matured? When, because he's chosen to meet Esav. He's chosen not to run away, as he did in the past, but to confront the issue with Esav. And we see Jacob as somebody in the past who's constantly tried to avoid dealing with conflict. He tries to manipulate his way out of it. He tries to deceive others in order, rather than engage in a genuine dialogue with either brother or father or father-in-law, but uses deceit to try to get his way. And of course, that's done to him in turn. But we'd like to believe that this encounter with Esau is now a chance for Jacob to show that he's no longer going to avoid, but he's going to confront things. And same with that angel or man that he confronts. He doesn't run away when that angel appears, but he struggles with him until the dawn. Uh, he continues to struggle. He doesn't try to avoid that. Um, whether that is a literal description of a physical struggle with someone, or perhaps uh, a dream that he has about struggling with his conscience of things that he's done in the past and saying to himself, you know what, I've avoided things and done things in an appropriate way. I'm going to deal with it now in my dream. I'm going to deal with my conscience and try to overcome it. Whatever, however we view that event, it seems to be an indication that Jacob is now matured to the point where he's no longer going to avoid, but confront things in a mature way. And yet, what happens in the rest of the Parsha? What does he do when his sons, uh, he sees that his sons are angry. Does he do anything? No. And what does he do after the act has taken place? What does he say to them? You've, you've now threatened our safety. What about some kind of critical uh, comment about the ethic, the morality of his son's actions? He says nothing. The narrator says nothing. We, there's, there's, no, there's no description of anything that they did was, was abhorrent. It seems to be they're, actor, they're acting in a cultural response that is appropriate at the time. Our daughter, our, sorry, our sister was raped. We need to take vengeance and show them this is not the kind of thing that is done. Are they going to make our sister and, and treat it like a whore? Are we going to allow that to take place? No. And then what happens immediately after that? Not immediately, but soon after that, we have the incident with um, Jacob's concubine, Bilha. Reuben, his oldest daughter, sleeps with, I'm going to come back to the terms in a moment, Jacob's concubine. What is Jacob's response? This famous uh, expression in the Torah, what does it say? Vayishma Yisrael. And Israel, with this new name, of maturity as opposed to Yaakov, and Israel heard what happened. What does he do? That phrase ends with an etnachta. There is no sof pasuk. An etnachta is a pause in the middle of a verse. Sof pasuk is the trop, the accent that says we've at the, we're at the end of the verse with a period. There is no continuation of that verse. It's left open. By Yishma Israel. okay, yeah, all right, he heard. And what did he do when he heard what happened? Silence. Nothing. Again, Jacob is avoiding confrontation. He's not dealing with an issue in a timely manner, in a mature manner, when he should have. So all this overcoming of anxiety and with his conscience, perhaps, in that dream, in the encounter with the angel and the struggle with God, what's that been for? It hasn't, it hasn't brought him uh, to a point where he's able to deal with issues as they arise. He doesn't, issue, uh, he doesn't deal with the issue regarding his sons and the inappropriate treatment of Dina, as he might have. He doesn't deal with the treatment of his concubine, Bilha, as he might have. And so Jacob remains a very problematic figure, even after all these things he's gone through uh, and seemingly uh, overcome at the beginning of the Parsha. The rest of the Parsha indicates that things, Jacob, Jacob has not come as far he, as he needs to in terms of acknowledging his weaknesses and finding ways of dealing with that and coping with encounters or coping with challenges in a timely manner and when you need to do it. And of course, what happens in next week's Parsha? The jealousy between Joseph and the other brothers. What does Jacob do? Gives Joseph a multicolor dream coat. Uh, he allows his son 
to taunt his brothers without responding in any effective manner. So Jacob remains a very problematic character, not somebody that has reached the kind of maturity that we might have liked to have seen following all that he's gone through and all the uh, treatment he's returned, uh, he's, he's received in turn from others because of his deceit and manipulation, whether it's Lavan or Joseph or his sons. So of all the patriarchs, of all the, and matriarchs, uh, Jacob is probably the most problematic, the most challenging, the most intriguing, the most engaging, <laughs> because there is so much, there's so much about Jacob that we can identify with. It's as if all the foibles and weaknesses and faults in character that we often deny in ourselves uh, and are readily critical of others when we, we observe it, we can see those all in Jacob. We have our choice of what to focus on. And, and I think perhaps Jacob serves as the best example of how we might see these things in ourselves. Because when you see one fault in someone, you know, whether it's Abraham, the way he treated Hagar, or Isaac, the way he dealt with his sons, or Rivka in her favoritism shown towards Jacob. And every one of the matriarchs and patriarchs has some issue that shows their, their uh, humanity and their lack of perfection. Jacob seems to take a lot of these elements into him. And maybe that's why Jacob is the one with which we might most easily identify, because if you can't admit and find something in Jacob that you see in yourself, uh, then you've got a long way to go in terms of understanding and acknowledging faults and foibles that you have and that you demonstrate and you express on whatever, with whatever frequency. And so it's, it's fascinating uh, and painful to watch Jacob throughout his life because of this, because eventually we're going to find something in Jacob's behavior, behavior that we can identify in our own behavior. It's not like a one shot or two shot with some of the other matriarchs or patriarchs. Jacob is going to uncover and reveal something in ourselves um, at some point during his, during his saga, uh, beginning a couple of parshiot to go and continuing right to the end of Breshit. One last thing I want to uh, just mention, I'll do this very briefly and give you more thought uh, than anything else. One of the troubling things I find about Jacob is, is his treatment of, uh, of women, of his wives, of his, of his concubines. If you look carefully, and again, this, this requires a little more time, I'm not gonna take it now. If you look at the way he relates to his uh, conjugal relationships with his various concubines and wives, the terms are very different. The term in the Torah that describes perhaps a favorable degree of intimacy between a man and a woman, it talks about the term la voila, to come to her, to meet her, to engage with her, the, the term lavo eleha. And that's the term used to describe how Jacob comes to Leah the first time because he doesn't know it's Leah. And then it says afterwards, vayavo el Rachel. He comes to Rachel as well because that was, uh, he, he knew who it was. So they're using that term. When it talks about uh, having relationships with his concubines, uh, when he's asked to do it by Leah for uh, the concubine Bilha, what does it say? Vayishkav ima. He lies with her. The word lishkav is often, is rarely a term used to describe intimacy in relationships between men and women. It's more of a physical um, uh, primal urge about lying with somebody and having sexual relations as opposed to intimate relations. So that's why Shkav Ima, he slept with her, and that's how it describes him sleeping with his concubines. Um, when Reuven sleeps with Bilha, the concubine, what's the term it uses? Vayishkav et Bilha. It uses the object et. He slept her if I translate it directly, as opposed to sleeping with her. The same term used to describe what the uh, Hittite did with Dina, Vaishkav Ota. 
he slept her via aneha and tortured her in terms of raping her, even though afterwards he, de he declares his love for her. And we don't know if, if Dina accepts that. That, 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 that. The whole question I'm not going to get into right now. But the terminology is fascinating. And so if we follow how Jacob relates to the women in his lives, even the way he has sexual or intimate relations with them, the terms the Torah uses are very, very well chosen. It's not by chance that they're using these different terms. They describe different levels of intimacy, different levels of mutuality, different levels of respect. And they're very, very careful about how they choose a word when describing with whom Jacob is having these relationships, whether it's with Rachel, whether it's with the concubines, whether it's Leah, how Shem uh, has relations with Dina, how Ruven has relations with Bilha, again, objectifying Bilha, perhaps because he's trying to do something to his father. It's not because Bilha was perhaps this uh, beautiful, voluptuous concubine that uh, uh, Reuben couldn't uh, resist. It's because he was obviously wanting to do something to his father. And that's why it uses that, that implication that there's some kind of lack of mutual consent with Bilha, as there was initially, at least with Dina and uh, Shem ben Hamor. So, I mention all this because this issue is something that does not go away and continues to, to be uh, prevalent. I read to you a few of the days that the United Nations has declared in recent, uh, during the course of November and December, that describes some of this. On the, we talk about how we treat children, and that can be how Dina is, is treated by her father and uh, so there was World Children's Day. These are United Nations declared days on November the 20th. On November the 25th, it was International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Um, so we have these days that acknowledge, and I don't know how seriously we take them, that acknowledge the fact that we still have a long way to go in how we relate to uh, how men relate to women. And it's not just that, of course, with all the... Uh, discussion about gender identity today. It's not just the simple and traditional relationship between men and women. It's between men and men, women and women, and people who identify differently in terms of their sexual identity, how they relate to one another and how people relate to them. And the last thing I'll read to you uh, is something from the, I've shared with you something with them before, the Women's Mosque of Canada from the Imama Farin Khan. This is what she writes. Uh, Today, December the 3rd, in honor of December the 6th, the National Day of Remembrance, where we remember the 14 women that were murdered at the Polytechnique Montréal on December the 6th, 1989, we also take this opportunity to remember the over 110 women that were murdered by their intimate partners across Canada in 2020, uh, reported cases only. Violence against women has no place in Islam, nor in any faith or any part of the world. As we remember these women and their families, let us also make a commitment that we will not allow violence against women to continue. At the Women's Mosque of Canada, since our inception, much work is happening behind the scenes to support many women in our community deal with violence against women, which is often couched and even justified due to misinterpretation and misunderstandings of texts and women's rights and roles within our faith. And of course, Islam is not unique in that sense. So we've, we've touched on a lot of different things today, uh, but because I was so engaged by so many things going on in the Parsha, I felt a need, even if at a somewhat hurried pace, to make sure I get to all these topics. I hope it's given you some food for thought, um, and I hope you go uh, speak with those who might have an ear to hearing about these things in your family and outside of that, and to get them to be a little bit more aware of some of the challenges, not just our biblical uh, progenitors faced, but some of the things that we all, uh, whether in our own families or in community, continue to face today. So if anyone has any comments or questions, uh, feel free to do so. Yes, 
Barb, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, all of that. It's uh, quite overwhelming. Um, on a completely different note, at the very end of the Parsha, and I guess this might be for a totally different uh, session, um, do you think that Esav um, got his retribution by when he crossed over and he married into what I would say a different tribe, created a whole new thing, and at the very end, there's Amalek. And that I thought was uh, really quite something. And now you sort of brought it all together. And I'm thinking perhaps there was retribution there. Or is that how Isav got back at Jacob in a different way? And there again, you're, he's using power and uh, deceit. And of course, I, 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 I would say that it's no coincidence. And keep in mind as well that Edom is often identified we often refer to Rome as Edom. Rome is, has the, the name, the nickname Edom. And so if anything gets back at mainstream uh, Jewish people, it's Rome, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem uh, in the year 70, uh, whether it's descendants of Edom or, or simply the, the name that implies some connection with, as you suggest, retribution or uh, getting even, uh, I'm sure it's no coincidence that they use that term to describe Rome uh, as some, some, something of uh, a punishment in some sense of later, much later generation of Israel, and of course Israel, the name of Jacob. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's any coincidence in, in, in using those terms and in, in perhaps the genealogy as uh, outlined at the end of the Parsha, including Amalek, of course. Good point. Lynn. Uh, do you think that uh, Jacob was was chosen um, as, as, as a conduit for the, the Jewish people because of his failings and his and his humanity? I think it's I think it's a great question. Um, I think that whomever might have been chosen, uh, you know, if there were other candidates other than the the patriarchs and matriarchs that are that are listed in the in in the gray sheet, we would have found in any of those characters uh, weaknesses, foibles, um, yeah. behavior that we identify with because it's not the greatest behavior. Um, but perhaps Jacob, because of all he goes through and all he experiences. Uh, maybe it's a bit of a metaphor for what the Jewish people experience as well. Uh, the, the travel, the tribulation, the uh, disconnect from homeland and the need to return. So there are a lot of themes in there that the Jewish people can certainly identify with. But I, but I think you're probably right that uh, uh, you're not going to pick. That's not our nature. It may be the nature of other civilizations to pick somebody who's seen as, as perfect or uh, a role model because of the ability to overcome everything. But I think our tradition, as with others, is to pick people who overcome challenges uh, and overcome their own, their own weaknesses uh, in one way or another. Jacob does. He, he brings a family as, you know, to use the, the cliche, as dysfunctional as it may be, he brings a family to a place where they are able to develop some kind of identity a generation or two later, going down to Egypt and maintaining that identity to the point where uh, they will form some kind of a nation generations later. So there is some success in what Jacob do does, despite all the challenges he faces and perhaps some of the unsuccessful ways that he deals with those challenges during the course of his life. Yeah. Thank you. Barb. I find it absolutely fascinating how the Torah still relates to so much day by day and as we're living our life, um, all the incidents can still be relatable and uh, so much time has gone by and yet we still seem to go through similar situations. Look, human nature um, doesn't change a whole lot. All, we, well, all that happens is we develop sometimes, and some of us, better tools, better methods for understanding, acknowledging, and dealing with the problematic elements in our nature, uh, how, how we think of ourselves individually or as part of a community. But humanity is humanity. Uh, and anyone who thinks that the Torah 
And I never hesitate to say this to my partner as well. Anyone who thinks of the Torah as something that has no relevance today um, that doesn't understand the meaning of, of uh, narrative. Uh, narrative is something that describes experience, whether it's uh, 5,000 years ago or five minutes ago. And Amazing. you can always see something in a narrative that, that is relevant because those narratives, even if the figures change, the geography changes, um, the clothing changes, the stories, the stories are the same and people are dealing with the same issues they've dealt with for ages. Uh, a lot, not a lot changes in that way. You know, as I said, we, we find better ways, some of us, for dealing with that, but not everybody. And not everybody has access to those resources and, and tools. Um, so if, if, you, if you're willing to look and identify yourself in the characters that we read about in the Tanakh, you'll learn a lot about yourself, less about the Tanakh. Anna. We need people like you to help us to find those things because... Yes. When I read, I, I take things so literally. <laughs> I don't go deeper as you do. And I, I need people like you, you and people like you, <laughs> to point these things out because otherwise I wouldn't think about them. Well, <laughs> we, we, we need each other because if, if we're not around together to hear a tree fall in the forest, it's not going to be of much value. <laughs> I got to get going, but it's been a pleasure spending time with all of you this morning, and I hope uh, I look forward to continuing next week. And I challenge you to to challenge some of those people in your circles with some of the issues we talked about today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank yeah, you. you too. Stay well and stay safe. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Barbara. Take care. Bye -bye.